All right, today, well, let me just go back. For the last three weeks, this is the fourth Sunday, we have been talking about uh, the signs of John. And last week I showed you how John, this particular um, disciple, he wrote this gospel um, to show us something about Jesus, to reveal Jesus as God. So every story that you find in John is there to show us something about Jesus, that he is God. That's why John wrote this. What's interesting about today's story, what I'm going to be teaching on today, which is the feeding of the 5,000, this is the only miracle found in John that's also found in the other Gospels. I told you last week that Um, John is the only gospel that is not synoptic. That means all of the other gospels, miracles, and and, um, healings, they all, um, it's like a historical account, and they all line up with each other. John is very different. It's not like that. All of the other uh, disciples who wrote the other gospels wrote those gospels um, as a historical account. They wrote those early Very soon after Jesus was resurrected, they wrote those Gospels. John was written when the Apostle John was a very old man. In fact, it was written closer to the time of AD 70 when the temple was completely destroyed. When John wrote this Gospel, he wasn't so much concerned about the chronology of the events. He was more concerned about revealing something about Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Well, John chapter 6. If you're going to turn in your Bible, you can turn there. I'm not going to have this particular verse up It's because it's just one verse. But we're going to start with this. And we have to pause for a little bit. And I'll explain to you why. John chapter 6 verse 1 says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. All right. We have to stop right there for a little bit, and we're going to have to take a little rabbit trail because I told you last week that John was written not only to reveal something about God, but it was written to show us where Jesus is in the Old Testament. How many of you know that Jesus is actually concealed and spoken about 1,000 times more often than he is in the New Testament? But if we don't have eyes to see, we're not going to see Jesus in the Old John was written so that we would see Jesus in the old. So we're going to take a rabbit trail and we're going to find the connecting story in the old today and how this ties in to today's story. But we have to go back just for a second. We're going to just go back one chapter before we go way back. The chapter before, which I spoke about last week, John chapter 5, Jesus heals a man at the pool of Bethesda. He heals this man, and that particular miracle, that one is unique to John in that it's not mentioned in any of the Gospels. It's only mentioned in John. Now, it says there that, and John, right after that event, and I didn't read this last week because I ran out of time, but it ties into today's story, so it's perfect. John chapter 5, verse 18 through 20 says this, and this is right after. After. Remember, he healed this man on the Sabbath. That's significant, and it's significant to today's story. He healed him on the Sabbath, and then he was persecuted. He was persecuted because he healed on the Sabbath. John 5, 18 through 20 says, For this reason, the reason of healing the man at the pool, therefore the Jews were seeking, I'm sorry, the, the reason he healed on the, on the Sabbath, therefore the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in the same way. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. All right, let's pause right there. Jesus just told us 
why he healed this man and why he healed him on the Sabbath. He healed this man because he was revealing the Father. He was showing everybody that what Jesus, everything that Jesus did was what his Father was doing. So we have to get an understanding of the nature of God. What is God like? God is like Jesus. Jesus came to reveal the Father. That means if Jesus went about healing, if Jesus went about doing good works, the Father is the same, which totally debunks this idea that God is the one who's putting sickness on people. God is the one that wants to keep people sick. That is not the nature of God revealed through Jesus. That's what Jesus came to reveal. When that man was healed on the Sabbath, he was also revealing something else about the character of God. And I mentioned this last week. The fact that an angel would stir that water once a year, anybody who got into that water was healed, reveals that God is a healer. Jesus came to show that he's better than the angels, that Jesus came to reveal that he is the healer. And all we have to do is receive. And that's what we're going to talk about just a little bit more today. It's significant that this man at the pool of Bethesda was, um, it says that he was laying by the pool for 38 years. There's nothing in the Bible that is insignificant. Everything mentioned has significance. And if you're a Bible scholar, if you want to study the Bible, what's important to do is to go back, number one, and look at the first time something is mentioned, or to find repeated patterns. In this case, there's only one other time in the Bible that 38 years is mentioned. And that's the story I'm going to tell you today, and you're going to see how that's going to tie in. Deuteronomy chapter 214 says this. This is where 38 is mentioned. 38 years passed from the time we first left Kadesh Barnea until we finally crossed the Zered Brook. By then, all the men old enough to fight in battle had died in the wilderness. Okay, what is that? What is that little excerpt, historical excerpt about? Well, this is a historical excerpt, excerpt telling us what happened to the Israelites. There's something that happened two years into the journey that the Israelites took in the wilderness. If you remember, the Israelites were rescued by Moses and Aaron. They were rescued from Egypt out of slavery and taken into the wilderness. When they were in the wilderness, um, God was going to make a covenant with them that was going to add on to the covenant that he had made with them. And bounty, and, and it was all dependent on God's goodness. It had nothing to do with Abraham. It had everything to do with God wanting to bless Abraham and his children. He wanted to enact a covenant with the people at the mountain. Well, you see that by the time that the Israelites got to the foot of the mountain, Mount Sinai, sorry, really quick, you turn the fan on. It's really hot up here. Um, when, you, when they got to the foot of the mountain and God was going to enact this covenant, the Israelites rejected God's proposition of making them kings and priests. They rejected it and they asked God, God, just tell us what we can do. We will do whatever you want us to do. But, and they told Moses, Moses, you be our spokesman because it's too scary. We don't want, to, we're not the ones who want to have this covenant. Just tell us what to do and we'll obey. Remember, they had been slaves. All they understood was working and slavery and doing. So because they rejected God's covenant, the law was given. The Mosaic law was given at that point, okay? Okay. That is the old covenant. That's what we call the old covenant. Okay? That is not synonymous with Old Testament. That is a portion of time and the law that was given to the people that put stipulation, showed the people how to behave in such a way that would keep them in um, a place of blessing. If they disobeyed the law, the law brought cursing. If they obeyed the law, it brought blessing. The law did. Okay? That's what happened. All right. Now, in the wilderness, we're back to the wilderness. When they were in the wilderness, it was only supposed to take 
11 days to get to the promised land. They were only supposed to be in the wilderness for 11 days. That's what Deuteronomy tells us. So what happened? Well, they started grumbling and they started complaining. And so there was a season of them having to wait in the wilderness. Until this time, two years into it, they get to the place, this promised land that God had told them, I'm going to give you. God had told them that this would be a land flowing with milk and honey. And that's poetic language. What that means is um, to to be flowing with milk is to say that there is going to be so much livestock that you're never going to run out of milk and meat. And the honey was that there was going to be so many bees um, and, and they were going to pollinate all of the fertile vines and fruit trees so that it, this land is going to be flowing with, with fruits and, and delicious stuff for you to gather. Remember in Egypt, what they had were leeks and onions. That was groundwork. It was back-breaking groundwork that they had to gather for their food. But Jesus was giving them a land where they didn't have to do any work. It was a a land that was going to be filled with things just for the taking. That's what God had told them that he was going to give them. So Moses sends out 12 spies to go spy out this land. Keep in mind, God wasn't asking to report back their version of what they saw. He didn't want their. He didn't want them to to come back and say, you know, I don't think we can do this. This is too hard. It's too big. That's not what God said. No, God sent them over there so that they can see what he was giving them. You see? That's really, really important. They weren't supposed to have an opinion of whether or not they can take that land. God was just saying, go take it. This is what you get. Look at the beauty that I promised you. But what happened is when those 12 spies went out and they saw these grapes, they said they brought back, back grapes that were so ginormous that they had to, two men had to carry them on a pole. One cluster of grapes was so big that it took two men to bring it back. But then they brought back a bad report. They brought back a bad report. And this is what they said. The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And listen to this. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Do you see what happened? They saw the giants. They saw the greatness, and what they did is they saw themselves as little. The giants that inhabited that land were actually afraid of the Israelites because they heard about their God. But the spies went and they saw the giants, and they couldn't see God's provision. They could only see their lack. They could only see what they didn't have. And then they viewed themselves as grasshoppers. And then they appeared as grasshoppers to the giants. That is spiritual significance that I'm going to tie in to the message. So, Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the spies that brought back a different report. In Numbers 14, 7 through 9, this is what they said. The land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. That word rebel is another word for unbelief. And we're going to see here in a minute, that's also another word for fear. Did you hear the theme today in worship? You see how the Lord has been working and speaking and wanting to deal with in our hearts? Can we just stop for just a minute and position our hearts? I just feel like right now the Lord is speaking. Like This is all a tie-in to what he's doing today. And what he's dealing with in our hearts today is fear. And so I just want us to position our hearts right now. Close your eyes for a second and just say, Lord, where there is fear, 
Reveal your light. Unveil Jesus to me so that I can see Jesus and no longer fear. We're positioning our hearts right now to put fear to death and fix our eyes on Jesus. All right. So they said this, no fear, uh, do, only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that saw giants as their bread, their provision. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Thank God he stopped that from happening. How did Joshua and Caleb perceive those giants? As provision. As provision. Whenever we are facing something big, whenever we're facing something that brings fear to our hearts, what are we going to look at? Are we going to look at the problem? Or are we going to look at the supplier? Is what the doctor telling us in the report the doctor is telling us our provision? Or is it a, something that we fear? That's what, that is what this story is telling us. Now, in Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews likens the promised land, that story that I just read to you. And keep in mind, because of that event, because those spies and the Israelites were all led into fear because of the bad report. They were not able to get into the promised land for another 38 years because of fear and their unbelief. They had to wander in the wilderness and they couldn't take the promised land, not until every single one of those men died and another generation was raised up to take that promised land. Keep in mind that that promised land was a finished work. It was finished for them. Remember, I say that a lot, right? The finished work. It was a land that was already completed and ready for them to take, but they weren't able to go in for another 38 years. That's what the story of the Pool of Bethesda is about. All right, Hebrews chapter 4. That promised land is likened to the Israelites and our promised land of the finished work of Jesus. Hebrews 3, chap, uh, chapter 3, verse 19 through uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says this. So we see that they, speaking of the Israelites, could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short in it. What? Let's talk about rest for a little bit. Right here, this writer is talking about rest, resting in the finished work. He says, the only thing that we are to fear is not being at rest. That's the only thing we're to fear, is that we're out of rest. Because rest is the same thing uh, same thing as believing. Unbelief is the same thing as fear. Rebellion, that's the word that was used in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy, going back to the promised land, I want to read to you what Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 11 says about this finished work, this promised land. When the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities, which you did not build, houses full of all good things, which you did not fill, hewn out wells, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. That's the finished work. It has nothing to do with our effort. It has nothing to do with anything that we can do to attain it. It has everything to do with what Jesus Christ has attained on the cross. Everything he purchased for us on the cross. That's the finished work. That's the rest that we are called to stay in. That is called resting and that's called belief. Did you know that Jesus lived in a finished work? 
He came to this world. And his eyes were not on the political system that was happening in that day. His eyes did not look at the sick people and say, man, those are too hard to heal. Wonder if God's going to come through this time. He did not repeat Job, in which, for whatever reason, Christians today love to repeat. And keep in mind, Job said it. God gives and takes away. Job said that. God did not say that. God corrected Job's theology. Job is the one who couldn't see God. God is the one that came and revealed his greatness and his mercy and his love. Jesus came to show us what God is like. He lived in a perfectly finished work. When God created the world, on the seventh day, he rested. And that word rested is continual. It never ends. It never stops. Jesus, when he died, and it's, he said, it is finished. It, Ephesians tells us that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Seated is a position of rest. He's rested. Psalms shows us that God sits in the heavens and he laughs at the plans of the enemy. God is at rest. And Hebrews is telling us that the only thing that we're to fear is not the giants, not sickness, not disease, not lack, but not to be at rest. That's the only thing that we are to fear. That's the only thing that we are to strive for. And you know what? It's simpler than you think. There is no striving to rest. The only thing that resting is, is to sit down and not get up. How hard is it to not get up? You're seated right now. It feels good. Stay seated. Like, it doesn't take any effort to stay seated. If you were doing squats, that would take effort. You're not doing squats. You're seated on a comfy chair. That's exactly the picture Scripture gives us. We're seated with him in heavenly places. Stay at rest. Look to Jesus and his provision and everything that he supplied for us. Now, we are going to get into the story. And it's not going to take me long. But I love it. I love it. All right. So all of that to tie in that very first part of John chapter 6. After these things. Now do you see it? You see the tie in there? After these things. He's talking about the Israelites and the promised land. And, and the man at the pool of Bethesda. And now he's going to tie it in. Because this next part... All goes together. 1,500 years after Joshua and Caleb, this is what happens. All right. And by the way, the only thing that that man at the pool of Bethesda had to do was pick up his mat and walk. He did not have to get into the pool. He did not have to cleanse himself. He didn't have to do anything except receive what it is that Jesus had given him. All right. John chapter 6, verse 2 says this. We're going to stop at verse 5. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude co coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? All right, here's something interesting about this. And I read this to you last time. Jesus entered in through a gate um, that, uh, in the story before, the Pool of Bethesda. He entered through a gate called the Sheep Gate. And that's significant because the Sheep Gate is where the lambs that were going to be used for sacrifice were brought in. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world, came in through the sheep gate, and it was Passover. You see the significance? All right. What's interesting is Jesus healed on the Sabbath, and he was rejected by his people on the Sabbath, and he ended up on a mountainside. Now, let's continue reading. Um, but this he said to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, 
that even one of them may have a little. All right, let's stop there. First of all, it says that Jesus wanted to test Philip. Jesus wanted to test Philip. Interesting. He was putting him in a position to see lack and to see how Philip was going to respond. Philip responds with 200 denarii wouldn't even be enough to feed this crowd. Back then, one denarii was what one worker would get a day. So in other words, he was saying, if I worked for six months, I wouldn't even be able to buy enough bread to give them a crumb. Keep in mind, this is recording 5,000 men. This isn't even recording the women and the children that are there. Historians believe that it was about 20,000 people there. So Jesus is looking out, and he's asking Philip, Philip, what do you see? Isn't that interesting how Jesus was asking him? He knew the answer. He knew what was about to happen, but he was testing to see if Philip believed him. All right. So then it says this in verse uh, 8 through 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Now, Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark actually says that Jesus asked them what they had. He's like the patient teacher. Sh- tell me, show, tell, you tell me how much we have. I want to see if you're going to look at this problem and you're going to see the lack or if you're going to see me and see my provision and abundance. All right? Philip, Philip, what did he see? Lack. Philip saw lack. He saw limited resources. Andrew saw the multitude, and he saw the need. Both were wrong responses. That is what we often do, don't we? We will look at our problems and we will see lack. We will look at our bank accounts or we will look at, you know, it's school season. We have children that need clothes and need all sorts of stuff because they need to go to school. And we look at our bank account and what do we see? The magnitude, the magnitude of the issue. This is the problem. We have conflict with family members or with friends or we get a report from the doctor and immediately, what do we do? We look at the problem. We look at our lack. We look at the great need and we see our inability to meet that need. That's exactly what it is that Philip and Andrew were doing here. John chapter six, verse 10 through 11 says this, then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Did you hear that? I love the tie-ins. I love the tie-ins. Make the people sit down. That's not insignificant. What does that speak of? Rest. In Mark's account, it says, have them sit down on the green grass. What does that remind you of? Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. It was a position of rest. Sit down, everyone. You're about to receive something. Disciples, watch and see what God can do. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. We're going to pause there for just a second. Now, this is important. This is significant. It says that Jesus took the bread. He took the bread. I'm going to read you Mark's account of what exactly happened. Mark 6, 41 says this. And when he, Jesus, had taken the five loaves and two fish... He looked up to heaven, he blessed them, he broke the loaves, and he gave them to his disciples to set before them. 
and the two fish he divided among them all. That word broke is in this verb tense called the aorist verb tense. Whenever you see a word in the Greek that's in the aorist verb tense, it's a one-time action never to be repeated again. It only happens one time. The word gave is in the imperfect tense. The imperfect tense speaks of something that's continuous and it doesn't run out. You see? I've used this example with y'all before, if you've been here long enough. I've given you an example of if you were to pick up a dirty rock that was filled with grime and you take that rock and you run it under some, a waterfall or some kind of running water and it gets completely clean, it's clean, it's forever, like it's never going to get dirty again. That's what got, that's the aorist verb tense. It's, it, it was clean. But if you put that rock back into the dirt in God's economy, that rock will continually stay clean. It'll never get dirty. That's, that's the economy of God. That is exactly what these verb tenses speak of. Now here's, here's where I want you to think. I'm going to tie this in. I'm going to I'm going to just like sucker punches three times to drive this home. Jesus was showing the people what he was about to do on the cross. When he died on the cross, one time to be repeated, he would never have to go to the cross again. One time only. And that action of the cross, it would forgive forever. It was a continuous forgiveness that would never end. You see what's happening? When Jesus sat with his disciples right before he went to the cross, he had his final meal with them and he did the same exact thing. It says in Matthew 26, 26, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Jesus is saying, I will never go to the cross again. Everything that we that this world was captive to. We were captive to sin. Sin was a tyrant. Sin kept us in bondage. I am going to break the back of sin and death, and it'll never, ever have to happen again. All of forgiveness would be given to the world for all time. You see? In Luke, after Jesus was resurrected, there were two disciples that were walking down a road, and this road was called Emmaus. These two disciples had been just talking about the events that had just happened, that, that Jesus had been crucified and he was buried, but something happened. There were reports that he was no longer in the tomb, and they were talking about this on this road, and then a man shows up on the scene, and this man was Jesus, but they didn't have the eyes to see Jesus. They couldn't recognize him. They were disciples. They couldn't recognize him. And they started telling him about these events. And it said that the entire way down this road to Emmaus, which was a few hours long, Jesus expounded about himself throughout scripture. What Jesus did is he went back and he showed them where he was all through scripture. I was in the promised land. I was Joshua. I was the rock. I was manna. I was the one that came from heaven and fed the people. I was the quail. I was the living water. I was at the beginning. I was the burning bush. I was there. That's exactly what Jesus was doing. I am. That's what John tells us. John, all the I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the living bread. I am the living water. I am the bread from heaven. Jesus was declaring that he was the, the one who spoke from the burning bush that declared that I am. I am that I am. I am God. I am all throughout history. I am all throughout your life. I am all throughout creation. Creation. I am that I am. That is exactly what John was saying. After that trip with those two disciples, Jesus sat with them and he had a meal with them. And when he had this meal, it said, now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them 
that he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Why is it that we need to see something tangible? They didn't need to see Jesus tangible. They needed to see him in scripture. They needed to see where he was all throughout your life. Where was he? Where was he? You remember him when you were three years old in your room alone and you heard a voice. You remember him. He was there. He was there when you were being bullied. He was there when your parents rejected you. He was there when your father abused you. He was there. He was there all along. He was there. He never left you. He never deserted you. He was there. That's what he's saying. He has never left you. He has never forsaken you. He has been speaking to you since the moment that you were born. He created and knit you together in your mother's womb, and he has a plan for you. He revealed his likeness, who he was through Jesus, but then he reveals your purpose and your purpose. You were designed, every single one sitting in this room, you were designed to manifest the glory of God. Jesus came to this earth to manifest his father and to reveal his father, and the same Jesus that walked the earth lives in you as Jesus is. So are you in this world? says James. That means not a single one of us are exempt from that. Every single one of us are designed to manifest Jesus in this world. And what does that look like? Love. That's what that looks like. That means when we are out and about in our workplace, what do we do? We look for the needy and we meet that need. When we find people who are oppressed, when we find people that are sick, when we find people who have been rejected, we run to them and we show them Jesus. We are called to manifest Jesus and to reveal the love of God in their lives. That's what we are called to do with our children. We are called to love our children. We are called to show them Jesus. When they become rebellious, we are there to show them the kindness of God because it is the kindness of God that will draw them to repentance. It is the kindness of God, not the judgment, the kindness of God. It is the love of God that we are called to participate in, and that is our purpose. That is your purpose. When he blessed that bread, he broke it, and then he gave it. The miraculous happened between the breaking and the giving. The miraculous did not happen at the point when the disciples passed out that food. The miracle, the point of the miracle was in between the breaking and the giving. That, was, that means that it all had to do with what Jesus has done, not with the disciples' ability. That should relieve you of a lot of stress, of having to, to produce something. We are not called to produce faith. We don't have it. I said that last week. We can't produce enough faith. We can't produce enough goodness. We can't produce enough holiness. You're not holy enough. You're not righteous enough. It's Jesus' holiness and his righteousness. It's his. It's the point of his body being broken and him giving us his righteousness. And the promised land is all of the benefits of the kingdom are like the promised land that the Israelites are supposed to walk into. They were just supposed to take it. They were just supposed to receive it. Do you see that tie in there? That picture that I, that I read to you today about the promised land and the houses that they didn't build, and the fruits and vineyards that they didn't have to plant. It was already provided. It was a promised land. It was done. It was finished. He did it. Jesus and what he provided for us in the finished work of the cross, that is the promised land. That's the finished work. And all we have to do is sit and receive. Sit and receive. To know Jesus is the word epigonisco. It means to know him thoroughly. To know him thoroughly. And this is the last thing. The disciples said this on that road. They said to one another, did not our hearts 
burn within us while he talked to us on the road. And while he opened the scriptures to us, Jesus is all throughout scripture. Here's the final thing. In verse 11 through 12, Jesus had said to gather up all of the leftovers. In verse uh, 11 through 12, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them. Wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fil- uh, fragments so that nothing is. Why is it that Jesus was so concerned about none of the pieces being lost? Has anybody ever thought of that? Well, here's something for y'all to meditate on, to think about. You can't be lost if you're not valuable. You can't be lost unless there's value. I've said this before concerning you. Jesus didn't die for junk. He didn't die because you were worthless. Jesus died because you were valuable. He laid down his life because your value and your value is based on the love it means there's much value think about that person in your life who you would say is lost they are valuable to God think of that person who's difficult in your life and you have been having a hard time forgiving them or bringing peace to the relationship. That person is valuable to God. And he's empowered us with his spirit to release his love to them. That should give you the power to do it. Grace is the power of God. That's what grace is. Later on, next week, Pastor Ted will talk about the walking of the water. That's another sign. But right after that happened, because of this event, the crowds went to look for Jesus and they wanted to make him king. And then they asked Jesus to perform a miraculous sign. And they asked for bread from heaven, manna, like what Jesus, what God provided in the desert. They said, bring, bring manna from heaven. And Jesus says this to them, I, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. What Jesus was telling them is you missed it all along. You asked for a miraculous sign, but I was there all along. I am the bread of life. The value, those bread remnants, was all the bits of pieces that you have seen of Jesus. All of those things that that he has revealed to you, all of that is of great value. And this is the final thing, that that our ending thought. And this is the tie-in with with fear, that what God was dealing with, with fear. Jesus showed this to me this morning as I was praying for you. There are some who you're going to, you're going to get a glimpse of Jesus. And you're going to be satisfied just with that. And that's going to be your more than enough. But what Jesus was inviting us into is that when we actually get a glimpse of who he is in the presence of God, we are going to want more. And there are some who are going to chase after and want more because the more beautiful you see Jesus, the more you awaken to him, the more you awaken to the presence of God, the more you will desire. The more. And that is what we 
should never lose. We stay at rest. We look to Jesus. We don't look to our circumstances. We don't look to the doctor's reports. We look to our provider who is our bread of life, who is our abundant, our abundant supplier who has given us more than enough. That is who Jesus is.